Now that we've looked at the structure of cells, we're going to look at how they reproduce, how they make copies of themselves. In the next topic, we're going to talk about the results of that. We're going to talk about tissues, which are collections of cells that resulted from these mitotic or asexual divisions. We're not going to cover meiosis this term in much detail. I'll touch on it briefly. But meiosis results in the production of sperm and egg, and we'll cover that next term in Biology 112 when we cover reproduction. On this slide here, you're seeing cells in various stages of division. So what they've done is they've taken a dye that will bind to DNA and also the proteins associated with DNA and give us this dark purple color. Some of these cells are in interphase. They're not actively dividing. There's one that's very noticeably in late prophase, and we have a couple in metaphase and one in anaphase. So I'll invite you to go back and have a look at this again after we've gone through this talk and see if you can point out those cells. What is the role of mitosis? Well, for many single-celled organisms, unicellular organisms, it's the main way they reproduce. And what you're seeing in that top figure is an amoeba that's just about finished this process. So it would have made a duplicate set of its DNA, and then the cell would have swelled in size, and now it's pinching off into two cells. And those cells are clones of the original cell. And I should point out that most unicellular organisms still undergo sex occasionally. They will produce haploid cells that come together, or they'll produce haploid uh, nuclei that come together. Because although sex is slower and messier and it's more complicated, there are some advantages to having sex, at least once in a while. It gives you a chance to combine DNA, genetic information, from two different parents and create something that's new and has advantages offered from each parent. Another big reason for mitosis is growth and development. What you're seeing in that figure there is the very first division in the embryo of a sea urchin. Sea urchin larvae are actually very easy to grow in the lab, so they're used a lot for studies of growth and development. And it's pretty amazing when you think about it. You came about because your father's sperm and your mother's egg came together. Maybe don't think too much about the events leading up to that, but that resulted in a single cell known as the zygote. And then that zygote divided into two cells, they divided into four cells, they divided into eight, etc., until we get the hundreds of trillions of cells that make up you today. And all of those divisions were mitotic divisions. Another reason for mitotic divisions would be tissue renewal and repair. So some of your cells get worn out and they can be replaced. Neighboring cells are going to divide and they're going to give rise to cells that will take the place of a cell that was damaged or lost. Not all of your tissues are equally good at doing this. So your skin, for instance, is very active. Lots of mitosis going on in the epidermis. You create new skin cells deep in the epidermis and they move towards the top layer. And as they do, they die and then eventually they're shed. The liver is pretty good at repairing itself as well. Other tissues, like nervous tissue, not so much. So if you damage a nerve cell, your body might be able to repair it, but if it dies, it might not be replaced. I mentioned in our last topic that the DNA found in bacteria and in mitochondria exists in circles. That's not the case for the DNA that's found within the nuclei of your cells, and that's where the vast majority of the DNA is found in your cells. DNA within the nuclei exists in long straight pieces. And these straight pieces of DNA are wrapped around protein. The protein acts as kind of a scaffold to support the DNA because DNA is a rather delicate molecule. So those long pieces of DNA with their associated proteins are known as chromosomes. And the word chromosome literally means colored body. So when people started studying cell division, they knew that they could take dyes and they would stain something in the nucleus. And they referred to these colorful bodies or objects as chromosomes. You have 46 chromosomes in every nucleus in every cell of your body, except 
for the gametes, but we'll come back to that later. You have 46 chromosomes. You have one set of 23 that you got from your father and one set of 23 that you got from your mother. So you have two sets of information. The material that makes up the chromosomes, so the stuff they're built out of, that mixture of DNA and protein, and it's about 50-50 of each, is referred to as chromatin. If we were to take one cell out of the trillions of cells in your body, take the nucleus out of that cell, break it open and extract all the DNA, take those 46 pieces of DNA, stretch them out and put them end to end, there would be two meters of DNA. So you have two meters of DNA packaged into every single microscopic nucleus in every cell of your body. So how does all that material fit into the nucleus? Well, of course, it can't be stretched out. It has to be condensed. It has to be wrapped up and coiled up. DNA is wrapped around proteins known as histones. So the backbone of the DNA molecule has a slightly negative charge to it. These histone proteins have a slightly positive charge. What happens is eight histones come together in a ball and then the DNA wraps around the histones. It wraps around two and a half times. And we end up with something known as a nucleosome. So a nucleosome is one of these balls of histone with DNA wrapped around it. In the photographs here taken by a transmission electron microscope, on the left you can see DNA completely unwound with no proteins attached to it. It doesn't usually exist that way. Usually it exists as you see it in the second photograph on the right. It looks like a pearl necklace. It looks like beads on a string. That's what it's usually referred to as. So each of those balls is a nucleosome. And then in between the nucleosomes, we've got this naked stretch of DNA. That's how your DNA usually exists in your nucleus. It can be read by RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase will go along. It'll bind onto one of those naked parts. It'll go along. And then when it gets to one of these balls, it can cause the ball to fall apart and It'll unzip the DNA going forward and the balls will reform behind it. Now, when it's time to divide, the DNA has to be condensed a lot more because otherwise the DNA will just get all tangled up. So the DNA exists as kind of a stringy mass in the nucleus during interphase, which is the period between actual divisions. So we have DNA wrapping around these histones but then the histones come together and they form this tight coil known as a solenoid. And I'm not gonna ask you about that. I do want you to know what histones are though. This solenoid is then going to be stuck to other proteins known as scaffold proteins, and it's gonna be thrown into loops. So we get this massive condensation, this shrinking of the length of the DNA molecule to form a chromosome that is visible under the microscope as the cell is getting ready to divide. And this is what that final condensation looks like. So we have DNA wrapped around histones, histones stick together, they form a solenoid that's shown in purple. The solenoid is then stuck to the scaffold, it's thrown into loops, and then the scaffold of proteins is also coiled. So doing all that allows your cell to take this two meters of DNA and condense it down to something one ten thousandth of that length so that the individual chromosomes can be separated during cell division without things getting hopelessly tangled up. Here's a short little animation of how this occurs. And again, there's a bit more detail in this than I expect you to know. So we start with two meters of DNA. Now the two meters isn't one continuous piece, it's 46 pieces. We're just gonna look at what happens on one of those pieces. So the DNA is gonna be wrapped around this ball of eight histones. And we've got this naked section of bare DNA in between. Now another histone called histone H1 comes along and it clamps onto that ball to keep everything in place. What happens next is those histone H1s come together and they wind this into a spiral known as a solenoid. 
So we've already condensed the DNA quite a bit. This is also something cells will do to turn off parts of a chromosome because once things are wound up this tightly, RNA polymerase can't access the DNA. But this is done to all of your DNA just prior to the actual act of division. The next thing that's gonna happen is this solenoid is gonna be thrown into these loops and then stuck to a scaffold of proteins. And then finally, that's gonna be all coiled up. And this is how those proteins and the DNA assemble themselves into a chromosome that's gonna be used during the process of division. Once the DNA is condensed, the chromosomes will move to the center of the cell, attach themselves to the mitotic spindle, and walk along that spindle to either pole. So this allows the DNA to be segregated between the two new cells without getting all tangled and broken. The terminology used to describe chromosomes can be a bit confusing. So remember we have chromatin, which is the material, mixture of protein and DNA that makes up a chromosome. But a chromosome can consist of one part or two parts. So at the top of this figure, you're seeing a chromosome that contains one piece of DNA. But after this chromosome is replicated prior to division, it's going to look like this. It's going to consist of two pieces of DNA. So there's a big long piece of DNA all coiled up in here. There's another piece of DNA, identical piece, coiled up in here. Both of these are called a chromosome. So this one at the top, consisting of just one body, is known as a chromosome. And this is also known as a chromosome, even though it contains twice as much material. We say that the second chromosome consists of two sister chromatids. So each one of these parts, this part here, and this part here, is a chromatid. They are sister chromatids because they contain the same information. They're held together in the middle here by something called the centromere. This is this constriction here that holds the two sister chromatids together. Within that region, there are motor proteins and they form something called the kinetochore. The kinetochore contains these motor proteins that can change shape if we give them ATP. We talked about that in our last topic. And those are what attach to the spindle. The spindle is made up of microtubules. We'll talk about that in a moment. But these proteins grab on to the chromatids and grab on to the microtubules and they walk the chromatids along the microtubules when the chromosomes are separated. Another important term is ploidy. Ploidy refers to the number of complete sets of chromosomes that you have in a cell. So your gametes, sperm or egg, have only one set. We say that they have a ploidy number of 1n. So n is the symbol we use for ploidy. So you can say that those cells are 1n or simply n. The other cells in your body though, your somatic cells or body cells, are diploid. They are 2n because there's two sets of chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes are chromosomes that contain the same genes, they contain the same information. So you have two sets of homologous chromosomes. We can also call 1n cells haploid. Hap means half, and 2n cells diploid, di meaning two. So again, your egg cells would be haploid, and your muscle cells would be diploid. Another important value is the C value. C value doesn't refer to sets of chromosomes, it refers to the physical quantity of DNA.
gametes have the lowest amount of DNA. And your uh, somatic cells are going to have twice as much. So we would say that in gametes, the C value is 1, and in diploid cells, the C value is 2. However, we can also have a C value of 4. So after a cell has gone through the S phase, where DNA is replicated, but before it's actually divided, it has a C value of 4. And the next slide I'm going to show you, I'm going to present an example of this. So hopefully that will make more sense if it doesn't make sense just yet. But C value, you're physically measuring the amount of DNA in a cell and comparing it to what we find in a gamete. So you might extract the DNA and weigh it. You might uh, extract the DNA and count all the nucleotides. You could, I guess, take all the DNA and put it end to end and measure the length. Uh, but you're measuring the physical quantity of DNA. So I'm going to attempt to draw some hypothetical cells to illustrate how you would use the terms ploidy and c-value in an actual example. My drawings are going to be pretty bad because it's difficult to draw with the mouse, so bear with me here. Let's say we have a sperm cell. See? Pretty awful. And we have an egg cell. Now, if we were talking about human gametes, there would be 23 distinct chromosomes in both of these cells. I'm not going to attempt to draw that. Instead, let's say that we're dealing with a hypothetical animal that only has two chromosomes in its gametes. I'll use two different colors here. So for the egg, let's use red for our two chromosomes. And in this example, let's say we have one long chromosome and one short chromosome. And I'll use blue for the chromosomes in the sperm. Again, one long and one short. The short chromosome in the sperm and the short chromosome in the egg are homologous. They contain the same information. The long chromosome in the sperm and the long chromosome in the egg are homologous. They contain the same information. And when I say same information, I mean they contain the same genes. Now, of course, the genes from the mother and father will be slightly different. There will be some slight variation. Now, these two cells will come together and form a zygote. So we've got our zygote forming here. And we have contributions from both the mother and the father. So we're going to get a long and short chromosome contributed by the mother, and we're going to get a long and short chromosome contributed by the father. And note that I'm not drawing the nuclei. We're not going to worry about any of that. I'm just focusing on the chromosomes. Okay, so we have now a diploid cell. This is a 2N cell. I draw my twos really weird. So a diploid cell has two sets of homologous chromosomes. The gametes are 1N, or just simply N, because there's only one set of chromosomes. Now what's going to happen next to the zygote is it has to prepare for division. So the zygote is going to divide into two cells. Those cells are going to divide again, again, and again, and again, and again, until we get our adult. So let's look at this cell after it's gone through S phase, which is the phase during which DNA is replicated. So I'll just redraw that again. It doesn't really matter where I put my chromosomes here in my hypothetical example, because again, we're not looking at the nucleus or anything like that. So that's the cell we just had. Now what's going to happen during S phase is that these pieces of DNA are going to be replicated. And now we haven't changed the number of chromosomes, but now the chromosomes are made up of two parts. They're made up of two chromatids. But again, the thing to note, this is quite important and it can be quite confusing, is that a chromosome that consists of one part is called a chromosome. A chromosome that consists of two parts is still called a chromosome. 
So the number of chromosomes has not changed. So we would still refer to this as being 2n, being diploid. Now the next thing that's going to happen, and I'm going to skip ahead a bit, is of course the nucleus would break down and the chromosomes would line up in the middle of the cell. And it, it's random as to how they line up on the metaphase plate, but let's just say it looked something like this. And I'll try to fit them all ah, in here. Um, that's going to be a pair of small chromatids. Right, you get the idea, hopefully. Um, we're going to have things line up on the metaphase plate. Let me get rid of that. There we go. So we've got our chromosomes lined up on the metaphase plate. They're going to attach to the spindle and the chromatids are going to move to opposite poles. So for this long red one here, the top chromatid is going to move to that pole. The bottom chromatid is going to move to that pole and the same for the rest of these. So the chromatids are going to be separated like so. And skipping ahead again, we're going to end up with two cells that look like our starting diploid cell. So we're going to have those chromatids pulled apart and we're going to get one long and one short, one long and one short contributed by the original egg cell. And we're going to get one long and one short, one long, one short, contributed by the original sperm cell. And the ploidy didn't change this entire time. So this has been 2n all the way through in the stages that I've shown here. Okay, so again, make sure that makes sense because when we go from chromosomes that consist of one piece to chromosomes that consist of two pieces, although we have doubled the amount of DNA, we have not doubled the number of homologous chromosomes. Okay, so let's look at the C value. The lowest C value we can have is what we see in the gametes. You can't have a cell that has less DNA than we see in the gametes. If you do, something important is missing. So our C value for the gametes is one. The C value for the zygote is two, because we've combined two gametes. And again, to measure C value, what you would do is extract the DNA and weigh it, or perhaps you would count the number of nucleotides. So we could take our gametes, weigh the amount of DNA, take the zygote, weigh the amount of DNA, and we would find that we have twice as much DNA in the zygote than we do in one of the gametes. In the next cell, after the S phase, after the DNA has been replicated, we have four times the quantity of DNA that we had in the gametes. And that's the case here as well with all the chromatids in the middle of the cell. And finally, for our end product here, C value is two. So hopefully that makes sense. And if it doesn't, listen to this again and maybe make your own examples as well. But if this makes sense to you, if you understand ploidy and you understand C value, then you understand cell division. And I may give you a question like this at some point where I ask you C values and ploidy values. The chromosomes found in humans have all been numbered and they can be identified based on their length, based on the position of the centromere, it's not always right in the center, and also based on their staining patterns. So there's a special dye we can use that will stain different parts of the chromosome more intensely. So we can identify 23 distinct chromosomes in, let's say, uh, a gamete. Now, a karyotype is something that's done to look for genetic 
abnormalities typically in an unborn um, fetus. What you can do is you can find a cell, a somatic cell, that is undergoing division. Specifically, you want to find a cell that's in metaphase. You can take a picture of that cell and you can sort out all of the different chromosomes and build this kind of uh, plot that you see here called a karyotype. And what you're looking for is abnormal numbers of chromosomes. In the past, before we went all digital, what you would do is you would actually take a photo of a metaphase cell under a microscope, and then you would blow that up and you'd get out your scissors and you'd cut out all of the different chromosomes that you could see and pair them up and see if you had a normal karyotype. What you're seeing here is a normal karyotype. So we've got 22 somatic chromosomes, they're called. Those are chromosomes that aren't involved in sex determination. And then we've got an X and a Y, if you're male. Remember, we're dealing with a diploid cell here. Or two Xs, if you're female. Keep in mind that when we're looking at this, we're looking at a cell that has a C value of four. So each one of these chromosomes actually consists of two chromatids. You can't really see it, but I mean, there'd be one chromatid here and a sister chromatid next to it like that. So we could use this to look for abnormality. So what kind of abnormality might we find? Well, we might find that there's an extra X. We can have individuals that are born XXX. We can have individuals that are born XXY or XYY. Um, or we might have an extra somatic chromosome. The most common aberration would be an extra 21 chromosome. That's something known as trisomy 21, but you probably know it as Down syndrome. And of course that causes some developmental issues. And that's something we'll talk about more. We'll talk about that in Biology 112 quite a bit. Here's another example of a karyotype, this time using fluorescent dyes, the dyes will recognize certain regions of the chromosome based on the quantity of C's and G's versus A's and T's, but we won't get into that in a lot of detail. Just recognize that you can use these dyes to see banding patterns that are specific to a certain chromosome. And this is a normal karyotype from a normal male. So typically what they would do is they would collect some amniotic fluid that's the fluid that would surround a baby in the womb. And within that fluid, there's going to be some skin cells that have been lost by the baby. They can collect those, photograph a cell that's in metaphase, and then take the chromosomes and arrange them. So keep in mind, this isn't the way they're arranged on the metaphase plate. Basically, they would have found this chromosome somewhere on the metaphase plate. They would have looked for its homologue here and then they would put them together on this karyotype, on this diagram, to see if there were any abnormalities. Now that we've looked at some background information, let's talk about the events leading up to cell division and the events that occur during cell division itself. So the actual cell division can be broken into two parts, mitosis and cytokinesis, and together we call this the mitotic phase, or M phase, of the entire cell cycle. Mitosis involves just the condensation and segregation of chromosomes, as well as the dissolution and reforming of the nucleus. Cytokinesis occurs after mitosis, and this is the division of the cell itself, the division of the cytoplasm into two cells. So together, mitosis, cytokinesis make up the mitotic phase. In between mitotic phases, we have interphase. And a lot of cells never leave interphase. In interphase, we have G1, G stands for gap. Then we have S, S stands for synthesis. The S phase is where the DNA is going to be replicated. So during the S phase, that's where we go from chromosomes that only contain one piece of DNA to chromosomes that contain two pieces. And then we have G2, GAP2, which is final preparations for entering a mitotic phase. We'll come back and talk about the cell cycle and its regulation briefly at the end of this talk. But first, let's take a look 
at the stages of mitosis. What you're seeing in the diagrams and the photos here is mitosis in plant cells, but the same thing happens in animal cells like our cells. We start with prophase. Pro means early or first, and this is where the chromosomes are going to condense to the point where we can see them as separate entities. The next stage, prometaphase, often called late prophase, is where the chromosomes have condensed fully and they're moving towards the middle of the cell. So the middle of the cell, think of it like the equator of the cell, it's something known as the metaphase plate. Also during prometaphase, the nucleus is going to break down. So at metaphase, the chromosomes have arrived at the metaphase plate and the sister chromatids are attached to microtubules that go to opposite poles. In anaphase, the chromosomes, now uh, consisting of one piece, will be moving to opposite poles, and at telophase, they're arriving at those opposite poles. Cytokinesis is where the cell itself is going to be divided. In animal cells, that means that the membrane is going to cinch in the middle of the cell, and the cell is going to pinch off into two. In plant cells, what happens is a cell wall is built in the middle of the cell, and that's what you're seeing happening here. Now it's important to note that there is no absolute clear division between these stages. And we can talk about early prophase, we can talk about late metaphase and so on. So the stages kind of blend together. Now I've got a short little animation here of the stages of mitosis. And I have to say this is very idealized probably a bit too idealized, but we've just plunged into a cell and you're seeing mitochondria there. And we've also got some lysosomes here. And there's a Golgi off there in the distance. Nothing is quite this neat and tidy in a real cell. Now we're gonna go through the nuclear pore into the nucleus. We've got DNA that will be condensed by wrapping around proteins and those scaffolding proteins, throwing it into loops and so on until we get these highly condensed chromosomes. Now what's happening is a mitotic spindle is forming and that's forming out of microtubules shown in yellow. The chromosomes are lining up in the middle. They never line up quite this neatly. I'll show you what it actually looks like in a moment. But now we've got sister chromatids attached to spindles coming from opposite poles and they're going to move along those microtubules and then finally the nucleus is going to reform and then lastly we have cytokinesis where the cell will pinch into two. So let's look at each of these stages in detail. And we'll start with late interphase, specifically G2 or GAP2 of interphase. So at this point, the cell has already completed the S phase, so DNA has already been replicated. The chromosomes are condensing, but they're not fully condensed yet, and they're not necessarily visible yet. They will be soon, though. We've also got centrosomes, and I don't expect you to know about centrosomes in any kind of detail, but they consist of two centrioles. A centriole has a structure that's very similar to the basal body of flagella and cilia. If you remember, that's the structure that anchors the flagellum or cilium into the membrane. But what they do here is they're going to coordinate the formation of the spindle. In the photograph on the right, you're looking at a cell that's getting ready to divide. This image was taken with a fluorescent light microscope and they stained different parts of the cell with fluorescent dyes. So the DNA is stained blue, the microtubules are green, the intermediate filaments are red. Remember that intermediate filaments make up the nuclear lamina that help support the nuclear envelope. So that is going to break down soon and we're not going to see those intermediate filaments anymore. Our next stage is prophase. The chromosomes have condensed sufficiently that we can see them as separate entities. Also note that the centrosomes are moving to opposite ends of the poles. At this point, they've got microtubules radiating out from them, making a star-like structure known as an aster. Aster means star, think of uh, asterisk. 
or asteroid. Also note that the intermediate filaments aren't quite as noticeable, so the nuclear lamina is starting to break down a bit. In prometaphase, or late prophase, we see the breakdown of the nuclear envelope. So there's still lots of intermediate filaments in the center, in the cytosol of the cell, but we don't see that layer, the nuclear lamina, that supports the nucleus, it's gone. Also note that the chromosomes are attaching themselves to the microtubules that make up the spindle. We have two types of microtubules making up the spindle. We have kinetochore microtubules that attach to the kinetochore of the chromatids. So remember the kinetochore is the part of the centromere where motor proteins live. And then we have non-kinetochore microtubules, which are simply overlapping with each other. By metaphase, the chromosomes have lined up along the equator, the center of the cell, along what's called the metaphase plate. So they're all lined up in a row. Note that the chromatids are attached to microtubules from opposite poles. And what's going to happen is the motor proteins found within the kinetochore that attached to the microtubules are going to walk the chromatids to opposite poles. So it's not so much a tug of war as you might think. It's not like the spindle consists of ropes or cables and it's pulling the chromatids apart. Instead, the chromatids are walking along the microtubules and the microtubules are being disassembled behind them. Now we also have those non-kinetochore microtubules that overlap. There's motor proteins there as well that are sliding those microtubules away from each other and that elongates the spindle and elongates the cell. Anaphase, the chromatids have separated and they're moving to opposite poles. In telophase, they've arrived at opposite poles and now the nucleus is reforming. Here's a more detailed look at the metaphase plate and the kinetochores. So down the bottom, this diagram in the corner, we've got kinetochores on sister chromatids. So the sister chromatids are attached along here and we have a kinetochore up here and we have a kinetochore down here. And these regions that I've shown in red contain motor proteins. And what the motor proteins are gonna do is they're gonna grab onto the microtubules, so you see them radiating away from the kinetochore, and they're gonna drag the sister chromatids along the microtubules in opposite directions. So they will separate and then they'll be pulled along on these microtubules. In the diagram that shows the metaphase plate, you can see that we have these overlapping non-kinetochore microtubules. There are motor proteins in between them, so there's motor proteins in here, and what they will do is they'll force these microtubules to slide past each other, and that will cause the spindle to elongate. So the elongation of the spindle is also, of course, going to drag the chromatids along with it. What you're seeing here is a beautiful set of images that show the very first division of the zygote of a sand dollar. You can see the asters at the poles of the cell, and you can see the microtubules that are attached to the DNA. The DNA is the light blue in the middle. And you can see that the chromatids are being pulled apart and they're being pulled to opposite poles. The last image there in the bottom right shows cytokinesis occurring as well. And I should point out that cytokinesis is separate from mitosis. Remember, mitosis refers to what's happening with the nucleus and the chromosomes. Cytokinesis and telophase overlap. They're both happening at the same time. And here we have cytokinesis. So in animal cells, what happens is there's a band of microfilaments just under the membrane, and there's motor proteins associated with that and they cause that band to shrink, kind of like the drawstring on a pair of sweatpants. You know, if you pull the drawstring really tight, it tightens around your waist. Well, the same thing happens here. We have a band of microtubules that are connected to proteins embedded within the membrane, and that band of microtubules is cinched, and it pinches the cell into two. And you can see that contractile ring 
of microfilaments in this drawing at the bottom of the page. So it really is just like a drawstring on a pair of sweatpants. The photo at the top is showing a zygote dividing and you can see this furrow that forms. That's the cleavage furrow and it forms because of that contractile ring directly underneath it. I mentioned that that last video of cell division was a bit too neat and pretty. This is what it really looks like. So we're zoomed in on a nucleus. The nucleus has just broken down and now the condensed chromosomes are aligning themselves on the metaphase plate and they're attaching themselves to the mitotic spindle. And of course, this is a time lapse, so this is sped up considerably. Now what's going to happen is the chromatids are going to move to opposite poles. So now we're in anaphase. Now we're in telophase. And at the same time, you can see that the cytoplasm is being divided up between the two cells. And now the nuclei have also reformed. Let's very briefly look at the regulation of the cell cycle and what can go wrong. The cells that make up the bottom layer of the epidermis of your skin are always getting ready to divide. As soon as they finish dividing, they enter into G1, they get through it as quickly as they can so that they can get into the S phase and prepare for the next division. Liver cells aren't getting ready to divide, they're just waiting in G1, but if there's damage to a nearby cell, then they're triggered to complete G1, enter into S phase, and get ready to divide to replace the damaged cell. Neurons, most of them, will never divide after they've fully developed. So with a neuron, we sometimes speak of it going into G0, because no matter what, no matter what kind of signal it gets, it will never be induced to divide. Most of the cells in your body are being told not to divide. They won't divide unless they receive the go-ahead. So let's say there's some damage to the deep layers of the skin, the dermis. Those cells won't divide unless they receive a signal saying it's okay to divide because you need to replace cells that we've lost or cells that have become damaged. One of the factors that can initiate this growth is something called platelet-derived growth factor or PDGF. This is something that's contained within platelets, which are a component of your blood. Your platelets won't release this unless there's been damage. So let's say a capillary has been damaged. Platelets in the area will release this factor and that will tell cells making up the lining of the capillary and making up the connective tissue around the capillary, it'll tell those cells that they need to start dividing. Fibroblasts are cells that wander around in connective tissue and they manufacture a lot of the collagen and so on that makes up that tissue and they can repair damaged tissue. We can take fibroblasts and we can grow them in culture, in a lab. So what you're seeing here is kind of a special sort of Petri dish that you can pour fluid into and you can grow cells. But the cells won't grow unless you include this PDGF. So those cells and most of the cells in your body need signals from the body before they will divide. So there's this external factor, there's this external signal that needs to be present. Normal healthy cells will also stop growing once they bump up against other cells. So again, let's assume there's a deep wound you've cut yourself quite deeply down to the dermis of the skin, and now there's a gap, of course, there's a cut. What's gonna happen is cells within the connective tissue are going to receive a signal that it's okay to divide, and they'll start dividing, but once they start touching each other, that means they've filled in the gap, and they should stop. And all cells respond in that way. This is a density-dependent inhibition. So what you're seeing here is we've got some cells that are being grown in culture, We've given them this platelet-derived growth factor so that they know it's okay to grow, and they will grow until they touch other cells, and then they'll stop. They'll form just a thin layer of cells. Cancer cells are problematic because they ignore these signals. They divide when they shouldn't divide. 
they don't care if there's no platelet derived growth factor they'll divide anyway they don't care if they're touching each other they will divide anyway and instead of forming a layer they'll form a big mass which is called a tumor so cancer cells are otherwise normal for the most part but they ignore all the cues from the body telling them not to divide they have mutations in genes that are involved in receiving or processing those signals. So they divide and divide and divide very quickly. And eventually, of course, that's going to be a problem. A tumor is going to press up against vital cells. It's going to disturb the tissue around it. It might uh, press up against a nerve or press up against blood vessels. There's lots of problems that a cancer cell could cause. So cancer is the result of unregulated cell division. Cancer cells ignore all the signals they get from your body telling them not to divide. There are a number of genes that are involved in regulating the cell cycle. There are a number of genes that act as receptors for things like platelet derived growth factor, for instance. And let's imagine that one of those genes that codes for a receptor isn't working. Well, then the cell won't get the message and it will become a cancer cell. Those cells that can cause cancer if they're broken are called oncogenes. Once you have one cell that starts dividing uncontrollably, you have a lot of them. So you have one cell that starts dividing uncontrollably, that becomes a mass of cells. So we only have to have one cell that becomes cancerous to create a tumor. Some cancer cells have other special properties as well. Some of them are immortal. They can actually repair their DNA. We don't have time to get into this in, in detail, unfortunately, it's a fascinating topic. But at the end of each chromosome, you have a bunch of junk DNA that just protects the DNA from eroding. Every time DNA is copied, you lose a little bit from the ends. There is an enzyme in the cells that give rise to uh, gametes that can lengthen the DNA, but it's normally only active in cells that give rise to gametes. However, cancer cells can sometimes reactivate that enzyme and the cells become immortal. Um, the cells also can become unstuck from other cells. So some cancer cells will stop producing the glue, the proteins that hold cells together. And those are the ones that are particularly dangerous because then they can metastasize. That means they can move anywhere in the body. So let's say we have a cell in a gland that becomes cancerous it can detach itself from the other cells if it's not producing those glues anymore. And it can go anywhere in your body. It can end up in your lungs, wherever, and give rise to tumors there as well. Unusual cells are usually kept under check by the rest of your body. Let's say we have a cell that is no longer making the proteins it needs to attach to other cells. Well, your body simply is not going to let that cell divide. So you'll never have more than one of those weird cells. But if that cell is not responding to those signals, then it can divide. So you can have cancer cells that have some unusual properties because of that, because the selective process isn't working on them. When it comes to fighting and treating cancer, that's a very tricky proposition. And the reason is the cells that make up a tumor are your cells. So they came from your body cells. They're not foreign cells. A lot of the cancer cells will display the same carbohydrates that healthy cells would display. So your immune system might not recognize them as foreign. Also, there's no target on a cancer cell that's not gonna be found on a healthy cell as well or at least there haven't been any really clear cut targets discovered yet. That's what all the research is about, finding a target that will be found on most cancer cells, but not on healthy cells. If you had a bacterial infection, you could treat that with a pharmaceutical that would attack the bacteria without harming you. So for instance, bacteria have a cell wall made out of peptidoglycan. None of your cells have a cell wall. None of your cells have peptidoglycan. Penicillin will attack the enzyme that makes peptidoglycan. You can take that and it won't harm you because you don't have that enzyme. When it comes to fighting cancer, 
typically what we're doing is we're attacking cells that are dividing rapidly. Cancer cells are dividing more rapidly than the rest of the cells in your body for the most part. So we could use agents that bind to DNA and prevent DNA synthesis. That would shut down division. That would stop the cell partway through the S phase and the cell would probably abort and die. However, that's going to affect any other cell in your body that's dividing as well. We could attack the enzymes that manufacture microtubules that are used to make spindles and that would shut down division. But again, that's going to affect your healthy cells too. We could limit somehow the take up of metabolites by cancer cells. Cancer cells are very active. They're always getting ready to divide. So they're very hungry cells. And if we can limit the uptake of metabolisms, metabolites, sorry, or the availability of metabolites, that would be a decent way to limit cancer growth. But again, it would harm your healthy cells. They wouldn't get what they need. And this is why treatments such as chemotherapy are so devastating for patients and they make patients very sick because they're harming healthy cells as well. So the best we can hope to accomplish is to make sure that that treatment is very localized. And of course, we can only do that if the cancer is very localized. So if you have a well-defined localized tumor, it may be possible to surgically remove that, take some of the healthy tissue around it as well to make sure you get it all. It might be possible to irradiate that small area. What uh, radiation will do is it breaks the DNA. And if DNA is broken in a chromosome, the DNA cannot be replicated. So that shuts down cell division. But again, it's gonna harm other cells within that area. So any kind of treatment we use to attack cancer cells is going to cause some harm to your healthy cells as well. If the cancer has spread throughout the body, so if the cells have metastasized and spread everywhere, then there really isn't a whole lot that can be done in the way of treatment. Finally, I'm going to introduce meiosis. I'm not going to get into it in detail. Like I mentioned, we're going to cover that in Biology 112, but I do want you to know the major differences between meiosis and mitosis. So meiosis is involved in sexual reproduction. It's a special type of division that's used to create gametes, the sperm and the egg. And the thing to note is that we start with a diploid cell, but we end up with a haploid gamete. And the haploid gametes only have 23 chromosomes versus 46. And of course, the whole reason for this is so that when the sperm and the egg come together, we go back to that 46 diploid condition. If we did not have meiosis and we produce sperm and egg that had 46 chromosomes, then in the next generation, we would have 92 chromosomes and the number of chromosomes would double every generation. That would get out of hand pretty quick. So meiosis is going to cut the ploidy in half so that that diploid condition can be reestablished in the next generation in the offspring. Fertilization also known as syngamy, just call it fertilization for now, that's fine. Fertilization is where the sperm and the egg fuse to restore that diploid condition. So in humans, our haploid stage is very short-lived. It's single-celled. It only consists of sperm and egg, and we spend the rest of our life cycle as multicellular diploid organisms. This is a nice diagram comparing mitosis and meiosis. And note that it is the same hypothetical cell that I used in the example I drew out for you. That parent cell that we start with for either mitosis or meiosis has the condition 2n equals 4. What that means is it's diploid and in the diploid state it has four chromosomes. If we were to describe the gametes made by this hypothetical animal, the condition would be n equals 2. We can use this same kind of annotation for humans, of course. So if we looked at, let's say, a skin cell in a typical human, that skin cell would have the condition 2n equals 46. If we looked at a human egg cell, it would have the condition n equals 23. Now, if we looked at the skin cell from someone with Down syndrome, they have an extra chromosome 
and we would describe that as 2n equals 46 plus 1. If they were missing a chromosome, it would be 2n equals 46 minus 1. Okay, so that's kind of useful annotation to know. So in mitosis, we start with that parent cell that's got the condition 2n equals 4. The chromosomes are going to be uh, replicated. The DNA is going to be replicated during S phase. And then we're going to end up with our chromosomes lining up along the metaphase plate randomly and being pulled apart. There's one division and the ploidy is preserved. So we start with 2n ploidy and we end up with 2n ploidy. The two daughter cells are identical to the starting parent cell. Now compare that to meiosis. We're going to start with the same parent cell, but notice now that after S phase, those chromosomes are all going to come together. The homologous chromosomes are going to team up into something called a tetrad. Tetrad means four. So we have homologous chromosomes consisting of two chromatids coming together. So we have, in this case, two tetrads. They line up on the metaphase plate and we have crossing over occurring between non-sister chromatids. We have a bit of exchange of information between non-sister chromatids within a tetrad. And then we have two divisions. The first division pulls the chromosomes apart. The chromosomes still consist of two chromatids. And the second division pulls the chromatids apart. And note that there's no replication of DNA between these divisions. So the big differences with mitosis, we have one division and the ploidy level is conserved. It remains the same. We don't have any crossing over. Um, and we end up with cells that are identical to the cell we started with. With meiosis, we have tetrads forming. We have crossing over occurring. We have two divisions. We end up with four cells instead of two cells and we cut the ploidy in half. So we start with a diploid cell, we end up with four haploid cells. And also those cells are all a little bit different because we've had exchanges of information. So the information you got from your mother and the information you got from your father is on separate chromosomes in your body. But when you go to make your own gametes, you take those two sets and you swap bits and pieces of them to make your gametes and all of your gametes are a little bit different as a result. So this is a nice overview of what I expect you to know for biology 111. So meiosis in humans is only used to make gametes. Things are different in plants. I think it's fascinating, but I won't go there. Meiosis is going to cut the ploidy in half. So we start with diploid cells. We end up with haploid cells in humans. There are two divisions in meiosis. DNA replication does not occur after the first division. Meiosis results in four cells instead of just two. And crossing over of chromosomes occurs and it reshuffles the genetic information in meiosis. So the gametes are all a bit different. Also remember that fertilization is the fusion of two haploid gametes to generate a diploid zygote. And the zygote is going to develop into an adult through mitotic divisions. The only cells that can undergo meiosis are found in the gonads, in the testes and ovaries. And here's our terminology.